Great. So thank you everyone for uh, joining us and FC for this webinar. And um, I would like to introduce our uh, presenters from FC. We have Michaela Zani. Uh, Michaela holds a Master of Science in Humanitarian Action and has four years of working experience in humanitarian and emergency settings. She joined FC DRC team uh, in DRC as MNE manager, and she's currently working in regular collabor collaboration with the head of programs in the design of new project proposals. We also have uh, Miriam uh, Rusiu, she's a development and humanitarian professional with 12 years of experience in programs development, uh, programs and project manager. And she is currently head of programs in FC DRC giving technical assistance on program development and management uh, with a focus on education and protection programs in emergency context. She joined FC in 2011 in Haiti as project uh, manager, working eight years in program supporting children engaged in armed conflict, child workers, and women rights and protection. She has a master's degree in development economics and international cooperation. So thank you, uh, Michaela and uh, Miriam, for joining us for this uh, webinar and this presentation. Michaela and Miriam are going to present their FC uh, research that investigated uh, to what extent cash assistance in their project contributed to changing life conditions of families with specific focus on children in need in DRC. So over to you, uh, Miriam and Michaela. Thank you, Miette, and thank you for the attention. In the present webinar, we will show you some of the main results of our study on the contribution of uh, the cash assistance on the sphere of the child, of, uh, on children's well-being. This will be the main domain we are going to tackle together. So let's start with the research objectives. So based on uh, the data collected on a multi-sectoral program, we established three main ob objectives for this study. The first one is to understand how the cash funds received through the cash-based uh, assistance were used by the family to cover their basic need and how then changes happened in their living condition. The second objective is to understand how cash transfer has, has been used to cover children's need mainly. And third, we are going to examine how changes evolve over time to so after each distribution, cash distribution, with a specific focus on children well-being. The project we used to do this research, uh, it was a Nexus program, multi-sectoral, that ABC did in consortium with other NGO in the area of North Kivu, is a province in north of DRC, specifically in the territory of Ruchuru, uh, in 10 uh, Air de Sante. This area is a return area, and the main objective of the project was to increase uh, resilience through the strengthening of uh, uh, community structures and basic service systems in this area uh, of the DRC. The project um, lasted around 14 months and it ended in uh, May this year. And the typology of the cash distribution was unconditional and uh, we delivered money through the uh, mobile money approach. In total, each family, 920 household, received a total of uh, 385 USD divided like this. The first three distributions were uh, of 110, like in, instead last, the last distribution was, was of 55 USD. For uh, our methodology, we use a mixed approach, which means we use both quantitative and qualitative approach. For the quantitative part, we used and compared two different questionnaires. The first one, it was the baseline survey done at the beginning of the project. And the second one was the PDM done uh, twice during the project. And both questionnaires were provided, created by UNICEF. This to say that we couldn't really put our hands on it and modify it. This is why we decided also to do a qualitative evaluation at the end of the project. We then we created through the expertise of the child protection sector and the MNE sector, a questionnaire for focus group discussion and individual interviews that you can find also in the link. So this is a bit the timeline of our study. We began in June uh, with the baseline, and then there was the first and second uh, CBT. 
after two distributions, we did uh, the first PDM, and then we did another distribution, the third one, and the a second PDM, which we didn't take uh, into consideration for our analysis. And then at the end, the last distribution and the last PDM three in March 2020. And as we said, we did the qualitative analysis a couple of months after the end of the project in August 2020. Uh, the sampling strategy was a simple random selection of families, and we selected 72 households, which uh, means 72 people representing the entire family. The research design was based on a simple contrast of results obtained in different moments of the, our evaluation. So after the baseline, after the first PDM and after the third PDM. The results uh, received from the quantitative analysis were then uh, validated and cross-checked with the community through focus group discussion. So now we can start with our results. The results will be presented in two different sections. The section one, we are going, as I, as I said, in the objective to understand how cash was used to cover basic needs from the family. So we are going to analyze the general situation of the households. Like in, in section two, we are going to deep down more on uh, specific family groups and how they invested cash to uh, cover child-related expenses. For the first section, these four will be the main we are going to analyze. So in terms of household general situation, you can see from the graph that we ask the family in different moments through the different evaluation, which were their basic needs, main needs, and which were the main expenditures they did over the period of the project. And we can see that food still remain high need for the family and also represent a big recipient of their expenditure. Instead, education, which represents usually a good factor for improvement of uh, children's situation, is at the at the bottom actually of the ladder because uh, not many not many families selected the education as main need not either not either as main expenditure what is surprising here is the fact that even if we are in a emergency situation in return areas in conflict uh, affected uh, areas uh, livelihoods still represent a good uh, tranche of the cake if you want to say meaning that families actually invested a little bit in something that is more durable. For example, farming tools, purchase of land, starting of income generating activities. And these will be recurrent even later in our presentation. In terms of coping strategies, here you can see the different sector representing the index that is usually used to, to evaluate coping strategies. And we can say that the more families uses these coping strategies, the worse they, they feel, the worse they live. Because as you can see, they are all negative attitude. And uh, there is, a, in general, a very good improvement in all areas. As you can see, so we collected this data in the baseline, which is the light blue bar, and then PDM1 and PDM2, PDM3, sorry, in the, in the violet bar. And we can see that in all domains, there, there is a good, very good decrease uh, in terms of coping strategy. Still, again, food remains a high need because as we can see, families still, still tend to rely on less preferred and less expensive food when they have to cope with the covering basic needs. And this has been confirmed also during focus groups and interviews. In terms of savings and productive investment, we can say that in general, the trend of related to savings is pretty good because all families declare to have started an income generating activity or to be part of a VSLA, which is a village savings and loan association, because these usually are the technique, the, the activities used in Congo to collect, to, to gather, to store money. In terms of productive investment, even if from the graph we can see that there is a decrease in what is investment from PDM1 to PDM3, uh, the portion on average is still pretty positive, considering still the context. And um, as productive investment, uh, as we said even before, before, we define, for example, house rehabilitation or agricultural tools, start of new markets and also education. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I said uh, we also asked families if actually uh, the cash-based assistance created any problems inside the community, but they said that no particular conflicts were recorded, just some uh, phenomenon of jealousy between beneficiaries and non-beneficiary of the cash. 
In terms of protection, instead, there was an increase of protection in general for the family, but in particular for children that are, that are now less uh, exposed uh, to situations like begging or vagrancy. So we can say also, according to what family said, children have improved their living condition also thanks to cash, thanks to cash assistance. Okay, we can now land on the second part of the presentation about the family groups and child-related expenses. These will be the five sections we are going to analyze together. First and foremost, I want to, under, I want to explain you why we decided to create specific family groups. Because uh, in order to understand what happened in the reality, we have to create an analysis that is adherent to reality. And using family 920 um, beneficiaries, and in this case 72, as a single block without distinction, is not as solid uh, to understand the contracts and to understand uh, certain tendencies. This is why we use these five categories in order to compare what happened inside the, these groups. So we use the gender, as we can see, majority of the head of household are women. The level of education, again, 60% have no education at all. Family with vulnerable children that we uh, classified as malnourished, critically ill, or with disability, representing 31.5% of families. Families with uh, vulnerable adults, which means adults that are chronically ill or with disability. Family with children at risk of protection, very important for us because it represents 50% in on average of all the families and risk of protection, meaning orphans and accompanied ch children or children who left armed groups. Before starting with the results, I also want to uh, make some consideration. First of all, the number of household members changed the, every time we did the evaluation, which is something very unexpected uh, for us at least. In particular, it increased from the baseline to the PDM1 and decreased from the PDM1 to PDM3. So how come this, uh, this happened? Uh, we tried to investigate also with the community and it seems very normal, for example, the fact that uh, families which maybe rise their income, like in this case, they receive the cash, they tend to host new people inside the, their household. Like a hypothesis of decrease could be that displacement since uh, main um, problem in Congo and marriage. This phenomenon has wide implication for us, our study and for all the study based on before and after comparisons because we have to always when we do analysis like this to be aware of the fact that what changes is not only what has been uh, caused or produced by our intervention. So reality changes itself also. And also the fact that our intervention can create unexpected results. Another consideration to be done before starting with the results is the fact that the PDM1 has been done after two cash distribution for a total amount of 220 USD per family, while the PDM3 was carried out after one distribution of 55. So of course, this could have influenced how households decided to spend their money and so as a consequence also on the result that we are going to present. Okay, the first domain we want to tackle together is the domain of education. We can see that after the cash, there was not a high big increase in the enrollment of children in uh, school age, because we start from 50, uh, 59 and we arrive to 63. Here, two considerations. The, the first one is that on the other side, it's also positive because there is no dropout, which is a major issue. Uh, in this uh, situation of emergency. And the second one is the fact that uh, when we discuss about education, we have to focus not only on the access in terms of uh, families' resources to cover school fees, but also on the capability, adequacy of the school to actually gather, to, to give instruction, to give education to all the children in need. And this is the main problem. This seems to be the main problem because it seems that is the infrastructures that are not able to cover all children's need. And this came out also from the focus group we did with the family. Okay, in terms of uh, education and family groups, we can see that uh, families with uh, vulnerable children report their children going more often, attend school more often than uh, families without vulnerability. In the first graph, if you can see this. 
And the same trend has, uh, has been recorded in the male-headed uh, household. Another section of the questionnaire was related to how cash could have contributed to children's well-being. In general, as a general trend, there is a, a decrease in what family think about uh, the cash related to children's well-being. So it means that the question was, uh, do you think that a cash-based assistant helped your children to increase uh, his well-being? And the answer was yes or no. So uh, also, please take, in take into consideration the fact that the question was very superficial to understand if actually the answer was solid. So we discovered that there was a decrease, but still we discovered a positive attitude among the household with a vulnerable child or adult, as you can see in the graph, because in both cases, the percentage of family with vulnerability, either children or adult, replied more positively if compared to families without vulnerability. So this is also something surprising for us. When we asked the, which were the causes of the, the sources of, uh, of this well-being, mainly the replies were based on daily expenses, coverage of basic needs such as food and clothing. Also in the interviews, they declared that children's well-being improved after cash distribution thanks to, for example, the treatment of cases of malnutrition, improvement of shelter condition and personal hygiene, but also a very important factor, the fact that children were more integrated in the environment, in the community. We are talking again about displacement and the returnees area, and less phenomenon of discrimination were recorded. Another section of the questionnaire wanted to inquire on the, how family did their expenses toward uh, the children. And uh, in this case, uh, we, we collected an increase in the tendency of 20% from the PDM1 to PDM3. And in particular, again, in the family groups, we can see an important uh, particular trend because if in the PDM1, families with vulnerable children or at risk of protection, they spend less for their child, later on, on the final stage, they tend to spend more if compared to families without vulnerability. This is very important because, and we actually double check this also in other section. This is important because it means that families with vulnerability tend to cover their basic needs with the first tranche of money. And on the later stages, they have the power, they, they could uh, save enough to invest in their children more or to do even durable investment. We were also very curious to know if families before receiving cash were actually uh, helped by the community. And it seems that all families declared that before they were helped uh, by family church members, communities, or they did the daily work or some of them, unfortunately, also begging. So there was a sort of network inside the community already helping them a bit, of course. And we asked the same question after the cash, and they replied that uh, nowadays they don't receive any support. They are much more self-sufficient because of what we said before. They also invested in productive investment. But uh, just a note here, it, it's very important to understand in the long term if this change is truly positive because it's necessary, it would be necessary to make, for example, an assessment to understand if these income generating activities are sufficiently profitable, are enough to replace the support that used to come from the community once. Okay, now some conclusions. In a context of severe economic constraints, we can see that uh, cash intervention results still in uh, food purchase or coverage of short-term uh, expenditure. However, it's very significant, still the part of money dedicated to investment in durable assets. In terms of education, we saw that cash did not have a great impact on uh, increasing education. But as we said before, this was also done mainly related to the fact that in September 2019, there was a free schooling for all children. So uh, this uh, activity, uh, this tendency, already contributed to the saturation of the schools. So we should more focus on uh, bettering the system than only focusing on the access of children, because it's not only a simple lack of resources that uh, hinder the entrance of children in school. In terms of children well-being, we could see that 
there were very subjective changes. Very important note here is that questions were sometimes very superficial. They didn't really go deep in explaining what, what was a well-being, for example, uh, or children's needs. And so family could have also some difficulties in replying with solid answers. However, families with vulnerable or at risk children seem to be more capable to use the cash-based transfer uh, in the long term, in particular if the transfer is provided on several occasions, so it's repeated over time, because it's like they have more money, more time to save uh, money for something durable. Uh, another important uh, note that we discover is the fact that uh, the composition of the Congolese family is fluid and community-based. This means that when we are helping a family, we are not just helping this family because this can have a multiplier effect, or better, we are helping this family who helping other people in the community because it's the beneficiaries, the first actors of change related to their community. And uh, something also very suggested by beneficiaries is the fact that cash-based assistance should always be embedded in something multi-sectoral, like a multi-sectoral program, long-term possibly, that uh, also help the community to strengthen basic service and uh, as a consequence can have a, a very good impact on children's safety and well-being. And last slide, now some li limitations and recommendation of our study that you might have got from, uh, from the presentation. So we saw as a limitation that some unexpected changes take place for example, the number of family members that keep on changing. So integrating qualitative and quantitative analysis or research method could be a possible solution in order to understand better the context in which we are working and in particular under which condition change occurs. Again, the non-linearity of the change, the fact that uh, after each distribution, there seems to have a, a new trend. So doing the repeated surveys at different moments and spaced out over time, in this case, uh, PDM were very close to each other. And uh, introducing a system of coding of beneficiary could help to understand better why, for example, there is a change that is not linear. And uh, last but not least, actually, the question of the PDM covered only marginally the subject of cash impact on children, even if this was part of the main uh, objective of the project. And in particular, it was a question sometimes were very superficial, some concepts very specific to child protection were not well explained, so this could have a great impact on the results. So a very good, a better research planning and the design of ad hoc tools adapted to context are essential measures to take for having better results. And these are our email address if you might have any other question later on. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Michaela, for the great presentation. And now we do have some time for Q&A, so please feel free to either post your questions on the chat box or the Q&A section, or if you prefer to unmute yourself, it's even better. For now, we do have a question from Crystal. She's asking, when you ask families the question, if their children well-being improved, do you give families a definition for well-being or it's how they perceived well-being? No, exactly. This is what I said as a limitation also. No, we didn't provide a, a real explanation of what well-being uh, was. The, the question was very simple in the questionnaire, in particular in the quantitative analysis. What we tried to do was to try to explain better the concept while we did the focus group. In, in, indeed, there we received the better results from the family, declaring that uh, after four months they could still uh, cover uh, needs of children and the children situation improved, as we said in the section about uh, risk of protection. There is also a question from Maya. Can you mention what is the minimum wage in DRC to estimate the real value of cash distributed? Yes, the minimum wage is around $100, $150. Yes, this is usually from uh, even much less if we are talking about communities uh, living in the village because uh, this is, for example, a salary of uh, an employer 
of somebody that has a contract. But if we're talking about villages, of course, it's very everything is very informal. So commerce, uh, uh, rather than uh, activities, they are, they are not standardized. They are not uh, uh, encadre with the with the law. But uh, just to make you understand, yeah, usually like a, a guard here um, earns uh, around 100, 150 dollars. So it's a good amount of money that the, the distribution in this sense. Maybe while others are posting their question, I, I also wanted to ask about sustainability, Michaela, like in terms of, because you mentioned that the project ended. So how did you make sure that actually these families are sustained in terms of economically? Sustainability is mainly what we discovered even with the subsequent evaluation. And even this is a bit of a trend in Africa or at least in the RC is uh, to saving money and then starting this agere is income generating activity which is some activities very very simple sometimes like uh, uh, the fact that they um, i don't know they collect fruits and then they resell it in the market and then they earn a little bit of money from here and they can reinvest it on their family needs so this is one of the main tool used to to make sustainable action for uh, for their families and the, the other one is uh, to enroll in this uh, uh, VSLA which which are uh, saving groups so you put quota and then you receive uh, some interest when somebody is uh, is borrowing money from this uh, system. So it's something very, very simple, but who is actually, we also evaluated this in other projects, is helping the sustainability also in uh, in school sometimes or community community level in general. Great, and is, is the project supporting those families to, to do these income generating activities or it's more on their own, like they decide on their own, the savings and, uh, what kind of activities to engage in? Yes, actually, in this specific project, we did uh, awareness campaigns mainly to make them understand how to use, how to save the cash received. But the, the result was very positive because almost all of them said that they started uh, income generating activities. So it was mainly through through this also because as ABC, we intervene because it was a consortium mm -hmm. with other. Uh, partner and other sectors so we intervene in the field of child protection and cash i can see rebecca raising her hand so please feel free to unmute yourself yes thank you um eleonora and thank you for this great presentation um i wanted to ask if um michaela could just like for some of the participants maybe explain a bit about um the context that we're in in eastern drc as well as you know like what the challenges are with cash i think having worked on cash in different contexts um congo poses a lot of additional problems compared to a um you know a kenya for example where everyone has phones and has mpesa already um and you know the additional security risks and things like that in addition to just general protection risks um when providing cash um and then also kind of the backdrop of like the community-based approach and how you're doing uh, other activities that support uh, these cash distributions and vice versa. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Um, so what we did is all, the approach of the program is based on the, is a community-based uh, approach. What we always do when we start a program as you might know, because we live in the same country, is always taking all the relation with the authorities and starting them from there to, to create some connections. And uh, so this is also what I was saying before about the fact that the beneficiaries are the main respondent to the community. So sometimes uh, the, the fact that we selected some beneficiary out of other, of course, created problem. Maybe not in this specific context, but in others. But still, what we try to always make understand is that uh, um, the intervention is not sectorial, is not meant only for a part 
of the community. We always try to explain the um, main uh, criteria of uh, selection of these beneficiaries, which usually are the most vulnerable. And uh, since uh, also there is a, a high comp competition sometimes in the area in which intervene, we also try to understand which community have already been uh, sustained and which other are instead totally new to this. And in this case, for example, they were returnees. So this is why we call the, um, and it's also thanks to the relation we created with the community and uh, the participatory approach uh, uh, that we always use. We didn't really have a problems in uh, implementing the project. Actually, we started this project um, replacing another NGO that, well, didn't really do well. Uh, so we took their place in the consortium and uh, we managed to end uh, in a very positive way. Great, thanks, Michaela. There is uh, also a question from uh, Peter. What do you think the factors that led to many vulnerable children attending school that to an extent that they surpassed those who are not vulnerable and were your in interventions destined for both vulnerable and non-vulnerable children from the beginning? As I said, yes, for sure, the families selected were the most vulnerable. So even in the group that we created, vulnerable and less vulnerable, they were all vulnerable. And uh, in particular, in, uh, in families where there was a higher vulnerability, we saw that actually cash has had a better impact, probably also because of the resilience of some families to, to being able to, to save from this money and uh, well, let's say that in some reason, some results are also still to, to discover better. We can't know why we, we just have the like, like the final, the final mirror. And this is what we discovered, which for us is very surprising. As I said, the, the concept of the research, it was to understand a little bit uh, how change changes happen during time, but uh, with the tools that we uh, had the chance to use, we couldn't go that deep. But this, uh, for sure, if we do another evaluation in the future, will be one of the main domain uh, that we are going to deepen to understand why this cash has had a better impact. But what we discovered, for sure, is the fact that these vulnerable families were more able to take advantages in the long term from, uh, from the cash uh, assistance. Great, thanks, Michaela. And for the other question, uh, I'm sorry, maybe I missed it, but uh, he was also asking what, why did the more vulnerable children attended school in, in a way that surpassed those that are less vulnerable? Were, were you able through the research to actually discover the underlying causes for this? Well, I think this question is the same as the one before. So yeah. the fact that it was surprising, but uh, we didn't have the tools to discover that that much more on uh, on why it was mainly for the vulnerable. Great, thank you. And uh, there is also a question from Facebook from uh, Renee. What tools did you use to assess the protection risks before the implementation? Yeah, we did focus groups, as I said, with different uh, groups in the community, uh, authorities rather than selected families, uh, even outside of the uh, of the. Uh, project, but also, for example, in the baseline, there was some sections related to main risks in the community, um, and also some secondary research that always help also to enrich a little bit the knowledge on the context in which we are working. Great. So um, I don't see any other questions here unless I, I missed something, but Thank you so much, Michaela, for this rich presentation. And we are going to share, because I know a couple of people were asking, we are going to share the recording and the presentation. Uh, we usually upload all of the webinars on the Alliance website as well. Uh, and we are going to share them by email. So thanks again, Michaela and Miriam, for staying with us today for the French and English presentation. And thank you, everyone, for your time. <music>